Hello everybody, uh, you know that uh, special senses include the vision, audition, olfaction and gustation. So in last class I talked about the visual system uh, that processes the vision and today we'll talk about other three special senses audition or hearing, olfaction or smelling, gustation or tasting. So audition or hearing, olfaction or smell, gustation or taste. Okay. So audition or hearing is processed in the auditory system. So auditory system is the system uh, auditory system processes audition or hearing. Okay. Olfactory system processes olfaction or smell. and the gustatory system processes gustation or taste okay now uh, like your visual system also in other special senses the system has central part and peripheral part. So all sensory systems have a central part which is located in the central nervous system or CNS and a peripheral part peripheral part is located outside of the central nervous system okay so outside now for the hearing the peripheral parts are your ears you have two ears those are the peripheral organs or parts for hearing for a smell peripheral organ is your nose and for taste your peripheral organ is the tongue now why peripheral organs are important peripheral organs are located in the outer part of the body and the peripheral organs contain the receptors so very important okay the receptors are located are located in the peripheral organs peripheral organs okay so <clears throat> that is very important and that's why the peripheral organs are located in the outer part of the body your ear okay uh, so the sound can easily get in and activate the receptors inside the ear smell molecules can easily get into the nose and activate the smell receptors inside the nose and taste when you put your your food in the mouth uh, in the tongue you have the taste receptors and that will be activated by the food molecules okay so receptors are very important and are located in the peripheral organs <clears throat> So first, we'll talk about the olfaction or 
smell and the olfactory system has peripheral part and the nose is the peripheral organ inside the nose you have the receptors where in the olfactory epithelium the lining inside the nose that is the olfactory epithelium that contains the receptors and central part within the brain central nervous system now if you see inside the nose this is inside the nose you can see and you see the olfactory nerve fibers are here so these are the yellow structures olfactory nerve fibers you have the receptors here now the receptors are located in the olfactory epithelium which is the lining of the nasal cavity here uh, in the upper part of the nasal cavity you have the olfactory epithelium in the mucosa and in the olfactory epithelium you have the receptors okay so first you see the olfactory or smell molecules from the source of smell for example you know delicious food the smell molecules float in the air you don't see them they are like you know very tiny so so small that you don't see them but they can float in the air and enter uh, sorry float into the nose nasal cavity and they bind with the receptors okay so bind with the receptors and that activate the receptors so when the olfactory or smell molecules bind with the receptors that will activate the receptors and when the receptors are activated then action potential is produced so smell molecules bind with the receptors bind with the receptors and that will activate the receptors and produce action potential very important that means the signal transduction occurs action potential means the receptors get activated and produce electrical signal so action potential is electrical signal so when the electrical signal or action potential is produced in the receptor cells that will travel to the central nervous system okay so that is the way how the receptors are activated and send signal towards the towards the brain okay now uh, if you see uh, when from the receptors the action potential or electrical signal uh, starts to go towards the brain first the olfactory bulb will receive the signal okay so from the receptors electrical signal will go via the olfactory nerves olfactory nerve fibers okay to the olfactory bulb 
olfactory bulb. We'll see that in next slide. Uh, olfactory bulb resting on a plate of bone that is called the cribriform plate of ethmoid. You must remember uh, from you know uh, your bone study that in the ethmoid bone there is a plate called the cribriform plate and in the cribriform plate there are many tiny holes called olfactory foramina you must remember that so from the receptors the signal will go to the olfactory bulb via the olfactory nerve fibers so these are the olfactory nerve fibers pass through the cribriform olfactory foramina of the cribriform plate and this is the bulb olfactory bulb okay so the bulb will receive the signal okay inside the bulb you have the cells called the mitral cells here so the mitral cells will receive the signal from the olfactory nerve fibers okay so then from the mitral cells what will happen the axons of mitral cells like this they will bundle together to form the olfactory tract so this is the olfactory tract okay and the olfactory tract will take the signal to few brain structures so olfactory tract will take the signal to the olfactory cortex hypothalamus amygdala and limbic system okay so those four brain structures will receive that smell signal from the olfactory tract now olfactory cortex will receive the signal to do what to give you the perception of smell what smell is that is it an orange or apple or banana or mango what kind of smell or rose uh, so what kind of smell is that immediately it will be given uh, that perception by the olfactory cortex okay so smell perception immediate smell perception then hypothalamus is mainly responsible for memory olfactory memory like you know uh, if you smell popcorn you can quickly tell you know from your past experience that uh, it is memory but if you never had you know um, that smell before experienced that smell before you want to know what is that right so uh, every time you you know uh, smell something uh, information is stored in the hypothalamus so when next time you smell the same thing uh, you can tell this is you know uh, the smell you uh, know about this uh, another thing like you know uh, if you uh, when you were uh, you know uh, sm a small child you used to uh, eat your mom's cooked food now you don't get that food for many years now suddenly if you smell somewhere that smell it uh, you know you it uh, you can tell that it's your known smell so memory can be stored for a long time many years olfactory memory that is stored in the mostly in the hypothalamus amygdala and limbic system are more related to emotion now what is olfactory emotion uh, like same thing uh, if uh, you smell that uh, the food you used to eat your mom's cook food uh, like now after many years if you smell that you get emotional the memory comes back and then you get emotional right so memory can create emotion and those are processed mostly in the amygdala and limbic system so you see that uh, that olfactory signal uh, goes to those brain structures different brain structures and they process different important information okay now one thing uh, you remember that 
thalamus is called the major sensory relay station. That means almost all sensory signals are relayed in the thalamus, but almost all, not all. This is an exception. Olfactory uh, signal is not relayed in the thalamus. It bypasses thalamus. Okay, it doesn't uh, relayed or processed in the thalamus. So anyway, so from the receptors, when the receptors are activated, action potential is produced. That is the electrical signal. Then uh, that travels via the olfactory nerve fibers. To the olfactory bulb okay and from the olfactory bulb the olfactory tract takes the signal to the brain structures olfactory cortex hypothalamus amygdala and limbic system now you see in uh, you know a more clear picture here so these yellow neurons or cells are olfactory receptor cells now remember, receptor cell and receptor are two different things. This is a receptor cell, it's like a neuron, okay, dendrites, and this is the axon, okay, and this is the cell body, nucleus inside. So this is the receptor. cell okay it's like a neuron like cell and receptors are tiny protein structures attached to the dendrites of the receptor cells so these are the dendrites and these tiny protein structures are the receptors okay so these are receptors attached to the dendrites of the receptor cells now you know the dendrites are here and the receptors are attached to the dendrites like this these dendrites are soft and you know uh, here like dendrites and these are called cilia so cilia at the end of the dendrite this is dendrite you have soft hair like structures called cilia and the receptors are attached to the cilia so these are the receptors here and when you smell something uh, you know the air enters into your nose and the smell molecules that you don't see very tiny uh, get into the air uh, nose and get attached to the receptors here so that is the binding receptor signal molecule binding okay so now let's draw the smell molecules they get attached to the receptors okay and receptor molecular signal binding occurs and that will activate the receptors receptors will produce action potential you remember that so the signal the electrical signal will go to the cell body so from here the signal will go to the cell body here and then from the cell body the axons the axons of the cell receptor cells are the olfactory nerve fibers so these are the olfactory nerve fibers okay the axons of the receptor cells and olfactory nerve fibers pass through the olfactory foramina of the cribriform plate of ethmoid you should remember the cribriform plate so olfactory foramina <clears throat> and just on the cribriform plate of ethmoid uh, this structure is lying this is a brain structure that is called the olfactory bulb and you now see inside the olfactory bulb i mentioned before you have the mitral cells so these are the neurons called the mitral cells and this is the dendrite of mitral cell and this is the axon of mitral cell right so this is the axon of mitral cell and this is the dendrite
of the mitral cells. Now you see the olfactory nerve fibers end here and the dendrites of mitral cell are also here. So the dendrites of mitral cells receive the signal from the axons of the olfactory receptor cells. So here they talk to each other. The axon terminal of the receptor cells, that means the you know, end of the olfactory nerve fibers and the dendrites of the mitral cells. They form synapses. So you see many synapses here. And this tuft of synapses is called glomeruli. So glomeruli are the synapses between those two cells. And then uh, the signal is taken to the mitral cell, cell body, and from here the signal will get out through the axons of the mitral cells. And the bundle of the axons of mitral cells form the olfactory tract. I explained all this in last slide. Uh, so then we'll go to the brain structures, those four brain structures I mentioned, olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala, and limbic system and you already know their functions so that's how the olfactory system uh, you know processes the smell now uh, there is a clinical condition like you know if uh, something you know hits this bone that is ethmoid bone uh, then what can happen that movement of this bone can crush these nerve fibers right makes sense so if the bone shakes uh, sideways then the nerve fibers will be crashed and that will stop the signal uh, from traveling to the brain so the person will not be able to smell and that is called anosmia anosmia a means absence and anosmia is no smell perception no smell perception so the person will lose the ability to smell something okay there is another clinical condition that is called phantosmia this is very interesting phantom means you know ghost probably you know that Phantosmia is, although there is no smell source around, nobody else is smelling anything, but the patient uh, smells, and pretty strongly the patient smells something. So that is the phantosmia. Okay, now we'll talk about the gustatory system that processes the taste. And you know, for taste, the peripheral organ is is the tongue, and you put the food in the mouth, and on the tongue, uh, you know, uh, you have the structures. You can see those tiny structures on the surface of the tongue. Those are called papilla. okay there are four different types of papilla four different types of papilla okay we'll talk about that uh, then inside the papilla if you open the papilla you don't see uh, these structures from outside you can see the papilla on the surface of the tongue but if you open the papilla inside the papilla you will find the taste birds tiny round structures taste birds okay so this is a taste bird and it is like an orange although very tiny but the structure is like an orange and if you see inside or peel the skin 
of the orange or taste bud inside you will find slices like this you know that uh, inside the orange you have slices right so similarly inside the taste bud you have the slices and these are the taste receptor cells so receptor cells are located inside the taste bud okay and uh, from the receptor cells when these cells produce action potential or electrical signal when they get activated by the food molecules the axons of these you know uh, uh, receptor cells will join together bundle together to form what the nerves that take signal to the brain okay so there are three different nerves that take the signal to the brain so that is the you know uh, gist idea so three nerves we'll see that uh, so first when you put the food on the tongue food molecules okay will enter into the papilla will enter into the taste buds and will activate the receptor cells located inside the taste buds and when the taste uh, receptor cells are activated the signal will be taken to the brain by three nerves three cranial nerves so let's first see the tongue the peripheral organ for taste uh, you see uh, in the most part of the tongue uh, mostly in the front area or part of the tongue uh, everywhere on the surface of the tongue you have this tiny papilla these are called fungiform and another type of papilla is also are also present that is called filiform so you have two types of papilla in the on the tongue surface of the tongue filiform and fungiform so filiform and fungiform are uh, distributed uh, like you know scattered on the surface of the tongue and they are very tiny <coughs> now uh, another type of papilla those are located in uh, the both sides of the back part of the tongue so these are called foliate these are like foldings okay foliate papilla in both sides of the tongue but where in the back part of the tongue not in the front and in the back part of the tongue on the surface you have larger papilla they are you know like 10 to 16 in number uh, not too many but they are larger and they line up in a way that looks like uh, inverted v or u shaped okay so these are called circumvallate papilla so those are four different types of papilla filiform and fungiform are distributed scattered um, uh, mostly in the front part of the tongue uh, foliate uh, only in both sides of the back part and circumvallate in the back or dorsal of the tongue but uh, they line up uh, okay now you already know that inside the papilla you have the taste buds right so inside the papilla you have taste buds uh, so if you take just one papilla and open it you will see inside the papilla you have taste bud like this and i mentioned you before that inside the taste bud you have the slices those are the receptor cells taste receptor cells okay like this so these are the taste receptor cells uh, this is the bud taste bud inside the papilla okay all uh, papilla have taste buds inside except the filiform filiform doesn't have no uh, doesn't have any uh, bud no taste bud 
that means no test receptors okay so these are not useful for testing the food anyway other three types have birds inside and the test bird is like an orange so if you peel the skin you will see you will find the test receptor cells okay and in the top part of test bud you have tiny pore or opening that is called test pore okay so this is the surface of the tongue and these are the food molecules okay on the tongue so when the food molecules get mixed with the saliva you know they can easily that liquid food can easily get into the taste bud through that test pore okay and on the test receptor cells you have hair like structures and on the those here you have the receptors okay so the food molecule food molecule uh, will enter into the taste bud and inside the taste bud you have the receptors okay so the receptor and food molecule will bind to each other so when the food molecules bind with the receptors then what will happen the receptors will be activated okay this is food molecule also called signal molecule okay so the binding will occur that will activate the receptor on the hair and this is the receptor cell okay so if i just take one receptor cell from inside the bird this is a receptor cell and you see the hair and this is the cell body this is the axon okay so the receptors are attached to the hair and food molecules will get in and will bind with the hair uh, receptors on the hair okay and that will activate the receptor cell and action potential or electrical signal will travel through the axon and these axons form three nerves you remember i said three different nerves are formed by the bundle of the axons okay and those three nerves take the signal test signal to the brain uh, another thing uh, just know that uh, inside the test bard you have the taste receptor cells i'm drawing again so these are the taste receptor cells nucleus here attached to the apical end and the receptors food molecules will enter through the pore this is the pore okay uh, so the food molecules will enter and will bind with the receptors on the hair okay uh, so these are the main cells the receptor cells however uh, you have another type of cells here these are the stem cells called the basal cells Basal cells are actually stem cells. Why you need the basal cells there? You need the basal cells there because you know if you drink something very hot or you know some you know hard food, then due to friction or temperature hot, uh, the receptor cells can be destroyed, and that happens all the time. When you drink something very hot you know uh, these cells are uh, destroyed so the basal cells are located here these are the stem cells can quickly regenerate or produce the cells new cells here okay so 
uh, you know that happens when you drink something very hot the taste for a while is gone then it comes back okay you have basal cells uh, or stem cells in the uh, olfactory smell uh, epithelium too you remember i talked about the receptor cells these yellow cells and these blue cells are the basal cells so inside the nose nasal epithelium you also have these stem cells which makes sense because we very uh, often get cold infection in the nose right and these cells can be destroyed so the stem cells are there to produce quickly produce new cells Right? So when you get cold, you know that infection occurs. You smell your smell perception is lost, but again comes back because of the basal cells. Very important stem cells. And in the nasal uh, epithelium, you also have a supporting another type of cells called the supporting cells. So three types of cells are in the nasal epithelium: the receptor cells uh, that processes the signal and sends uh, the send the signal to the brain and the basal cells are the stem cells and supporting cells are just to support the other cells so three types of cells are there anyway so let's go back to uh, the taste so uh, <clears throat> the basal cells are important because they, they are the stem cells okay to produce or generate new cells here you see the same thing that I showed you. This is uh, a taste bar, and you see different taste receptor cells like the slices inside the orange. And this is very interesting that uh, you have a number of taste receptor cells, and each cell uh, is uh, for the processing of each type of taste. For example, this one is for uh, you know salt this one is for sweet this one is for you know um, sour this one is for another taste uh, i don't know if you have heard uh, umami like protein when you eat the egg the white part of egg uh, so uh, these are the receptor cells and different receptor cells are for different types of taste so that is interesting right <clears throat> okay so now uh, from the taste receptor cells the signal uh, is carried to the brain by cranial nerve number 7 9 as well as number 10 is not listed here which is vagus okay so cranial nerve number 7 uh, which is facial number 9 is glossopharyngeal so facial glossopharyngeal glosso means tongue and pharyngeal pharynx so you have the receptors in the tongue as well as few receptors in the pharynx too uh, so <coughs> glossopharyngeal facial uh, this nerve is taking signal to the brain from the face part so some fibers also take signal from the tongue and vagus okay so these are three cranial nerves take the signal to a structure that is called solitary nucleus also called tractus solitaricus some places you will see it says tractus solitaire okay same thing so solitary nucleus or tractus solitaricus uh, these are located in the medulla oblongata in the brain stem 
okay and from there the signal will go to the thalamus you remember which is the major sensory relay station so the taste signal is taken to the thalamus and from there the signal will go to the gustatory cortex and also to the hypothalamus and the limbic system you already know the cortex gustatory cortex is for the taste perception of taste it will immediately tell you uh, what kind of taste is that is it sweet sour or you know umami or salty or mixed so that perception is given by the gustatory cortex which is located in the insula of the brain and you already know hypothalamus is for memory and limbic system is for mainly for emotion so taste is also related to memory like you know uh, you had a you know a meal that that you remember like you had a meal with uh, your very close you know intimate friend for many years ago the food you ate uh, um, at that meal uh, you uh, when you uh, eat the same food again you uh, remember that okay so taste is very much related to memory too like your old fiction and emotion is also related to memory we know that okay so you remember the thing and get emotional so that is uh, something uh, both smell and taste are related to memory strongly related to memory and emotion you know that a small uh, baby uh, when he cries uh, during sleep if mom go gets close to the baby the baby stops crying without seeing uh, by smelling the mother's body right so very much related to uh, the memory and emotion same thing as for the taste okay now which three cranial nerves that i have already mentioned take the signal from the tongue and uh, from the pharynx too pharynx also has some uh, taste receptors so uh, the cranial nerve number seven is facial number number nine glossopharyngeal i wrote in last slide and vagus number 10 okay uh, facial takes signal from mostly the front part of the tongue okay so this is the main one for the tongue and glossopharyngeal from the tongue as well as pharynx glossop means tongue pharyngeal pharynx okay so partly from the tongue partly from the pharynx and vagus is mostly from the uh, epiglottis uh, back of the pharynx and epiglottis anyway so uh, you see those three cranial nerves uh, take signal to the medulla oblongata where you have the solitary nucleus okay and then to the thalamus this is the thalamus and then to those three brain structures okay uh, so that is how uh, the taste signal is processed uh, the term gaussia again a means absence and gaussia is taste so no taste if someone uh, has lost the taste perception the taste of food then that is called a gaussia uh, <clears throat> then fanto again fanto gaussia if no food is inside the mouth but the person or patient uh, uh, taste and sometimes pretty strongly uh, certain food so that is called phanto gaussia ghost uh, dysgaussia dysgaussia is taste disorder like you know uh, you are eating the food but you are not tasting uh, enough so that is distorted or disorder taste disorder 
your test function is partially lost. Uh, Agaussia is complete loss. And Fantagaussia is you are uh, no food in the mouth, but you are tasting something. So that also happens. That's why it is called Fantagaussia. Okay, so uh, now we'll talk about the auditory system is responsible for hearing or audition. Peripheral organs are your ears and ear has three parts, external or outer ear, middle ear and inner or internal ear. And external ear uh, has these structures, pinna, that you can see from outside, external acoustic meatus, it is a canal, meatus means canal, so external acoustic meatus or outer ear canal, that you can see just the end part, right, that the canal going in into the uh, head, and then tympanic membrane or ear drum, same thing. Common people uh, say ear drum, but in anatomy we say tympanic membrane. Okay, so those three structures are in the external ear. Middle ear is a cavity. In the inside the temporal bone, you know temporal bone. So inside the temporal bone, you have a cavity that is called the middle ear. So middle ear is a cavity. And inside that middle ear cavity, you have three ossicles or tiny bones. Ossicles are very small bones, okay? As well as, it's not listed here, you have two tiny muscles. So these muscles, tiny muscles, uh, hold the tiny bones, ossicles, in right place. So they will not move too much. Okay. Uh, so in the middle ear, you have three ossicles and two muscles. Inner ear or internal ear is the most important part because the cochlea is located inside the inner ear. This is the most important structure in the ear because you have the hair cells inside the cochlea, okay, hair cells. Hair cells are the sound receptor cells, sound receptor cells, okay, so that's why uh, cochlea is the most important structure in the ear for the processing of sound because the receptors are there. Okay? Uh, if the receptors are not activated, the signal action potential or electrical signal will not be produced. The signal will not move towards the brain. Okay? So damage of the cochlea will uh, you know, cause deafness okay loss of hearing and you know probably you have heard artificial cochlea uh, can work uh, but will not be able to work like exactly you know um, uh, re uh, like real cochlea but it, it uh, you know uh, does some basic functions improve the sound perception okay so cochlea is very important okay because cochlea has the hair cells and hair cells are the receptor cells okay now uh, also in the inner ear you have three tubules or tube like structures those are called the semi circular canals Okay, so three semicircular canals as well as you have 
another structure that is called vestibule so you have a cochlea you have three semicircular canals or tubules and one vestibule now you already know the function of the cochlea processing of sound sound signal now semicircular canals and vestibule these are not responsible for sound processing but these are responsible for the equilibrium balance equilibrium or balance or body position body position all these are you know similar equilibrium or maintaining the balance or body position so not related to sound so if you know uh, any damage occurs in the semicircular canal or vestibule the person will lost the uh, ability to maintain the balance of the body or body position signal uh, will not go to the brain so the person will not be able to maintain the balance and uh, you know sometimes infection if infection occurs in uh, these structures uh, too much fluid accumulate then that can cause vertigo right the person uh, gets that that clinical you know uh, uh, condition or disorder that is known as uh, vertigo probably you have heard about this you know uh, this clinical condition okay the person feels like you know uh, dizzy and uh, a lost of feeling of uh, balance Anyway, so those are the structures inside the ear and uh, their important functions. Okay, so you got a, uh, an idea about the ear. So now let's see those structures and pictures. Okay, so uh, in external ear, you see the pinna and the edge edge of the pinna. This fold is called the helix. So this folding at the edge of the pinna, this is pinna, is called the helix. Okay, and the bottom of the pinna, this part where you put the earring, that is the lobule. Okay, it's a fat inside, lot of fat you see. Okay, uh, so that part you can see from outside, and this is the outer ear canal or external acoustic meatus so the uh, ear uh, pinna is like a funnel so it captures the sound waves that arrives uh, in the ear so it is like a funnel so it captures and then sends the sound waves into the uh, or pours the sound waves into the external acoustic meatus okay and then the sound waves will hit the eardrum or tympanic membrane so the sound is actually many waves sound is actually waves so many waves like go one after another and hit the tympanic membrane one after another very fast right so uh, if the sound frequency how many waves you have in one second that is the frequency okay if in one second you have like 10,000 waves just think that how big number 10,000 in one second okay so if in one second uh, 10,000 waves enter into the air that means 10,000 waves mean one 
kilohertz. Kilohertz. Kilo means 1000, right? So 1000 hertz. Hertz is the unit. So um, if 5000 waves in 5000 waves in one second, that is 5 kilohertz, right? So that many you know, uh, waves hit the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, and the eardrum shakes at that frequency. So when the eardrum shakes, what happens, you see, this is the middle ear here, cavity inside the tympanic bone, uh, cavity inside the temporal bone, okay? So three ossicles are malleus, incus, and steps. So these are the three ossicles and they are attached to each other, you see here, here, they are attached to each other. So first one is the malleus, Middle one is the incus, and the last one is the steps. So you see, the malleus is attached to the other side of the tympanic membrane. So sound waves hit uh, comes from outside and hit here, and shakes the tympanic membrane. Okay, and in the other side of the tympanic membrane, you have the malleus attached. So malleus will also shake at the same rate. And when the malleus will shake, since the other end of malleus is attached to the incus, incus will sh shake. And also the steps will vibrate or shake. So these three ossicles, they are attached to each other and act as liver. And you know uh, that uh, uh, liver uh, amplifies the sound. A anything, you know, uh, the uh, liver, uh, you know, when uh, you see the construction of, you know, big building or road, you see the cranes. Uh, the cranes, the, uh, the parts of the cranes are uh, attached to each other like the ossicles are attached to each other inside the middle ear and they uh, can you know lift heavy weight uh, because uh, you know the liver uh, like helps to amplify the function okay uh, so uh, that is uh, the function of those three ossicles function of those three ossicles okay so these ossicles uh, work as lever liver and uh, amplifies the sound many times sound pressure not the frequency sound pressure or intensity same thing so <coughs> uh, if the sound is 10 kilohertz that means 10,000 times that uh, frequency will not change will remain same but the pressure of sound will be amplified many times and in the uh, area where the steps is attached that is called the oval window you see oval shaped right not completely round it's like oval and that's why it is called oval window it is a membrane too so when these three ossicles shake, shake uh, that amplifies the sound pressure and uh, that will also shake the oval window. Okay, so just know that. And now we'll see the inner ear. 
this is the cochlea it is a snail shaped bony fluid filled structure so it is a coiled snail shaped bony fluid filled structure in the inner ear so if you break this shell inside the cochlea you will find the fluid okay and this is the vestibule this part and semicircular canals you remember i mentioned in last slide so this one is for sound because the hair cells are inside this hair cells are located inside the cochlea and uh, the vestibule and semicircular canals are partially fluid with uh, filled with fluid and when you tilt your head the fluid moves inside them and that fluid movement can give uh, the information which way you are moving your head it is like you know uh, if this is a tube if you take a tube and you know uh, partially fill not completely like partially fill with water or fluid now if you move this side down the fluid will or water will move to this side right if you move this side down the fluid will move to this side and you have the sensors here in the wall of those semicircular canals so they can detect which way the motion of the fluid so that's a, a very simple mechanism and that will that signal will go to the brain okay to tell the brain which way your body or head is tilting and then brain will take care of that to maintain the balance okay so let's see uh, here so this is the middle ear here <clears throat> and this is the malleus the first ossicle this is the incus and this is the steps okay and they are attached to each other and first one malleus is also attached to the tympanic membrane or eardrum and the last one the steps I already mentioned is attached to the oval window here. Okay. So when the tympanic membrane shakes, the ossicles shake. Okay. That amplifies the sound pressure. Why you need to amplify the pressure by the ossicles? Why you need these ossicles? The sound wave that travels in the air. Uh, can easily displace or move the air makes sense to move the air it is you don't need a lot of pressure okay so sound waves can move the air and create waves in the air but inside the cochlea you remember i said you have fluid so cochlea is filled with fluid so when that you know uh, uh, the uh, waves will arrive here to move the fluid you need much more pressure than the air so now the function is moving the fluid and create waves in the fluid so how the uh, waves in the air can create waves in the fluid you cannot do that unless the pressure is amplified because to displace the fluid or move the fluid you need more pressure right so that's why you have those ossicles there is a clinical condition that is called autosclerosis uh, what happens in autosclerosis uh, these joints between the ossicles get hard flexibility of the joint is lost that can occur due to accumulation of fat as well as calcium that can form like you know a bone like tissue here hard tissue and that will uh, you know decrease the flexibility of these joints and if that happens then the ossicles will not be able to move enough uh, the amplification of sound pressure will not occur so if sound is not amplified then that will not be able to move the 
fluid enough right so the person will not be able to hear that is one reason of loss of hearing okay due to loss of the movement of the ossicles okay uh, another clinical condition that is called otitis media uh, infection of the middle ear infection of middle ear so fluid can accumulate here inside and can also reduce the movement of the ossicles okay now uh, so this is the cochlea vestibule semicircular canals okay and you see from this is important from uh, the cochlea the nerve that gets out to take the signal to the brain towards the brain that is the cochlear nerve makes sense attached to the cochlea and this is for sound right and the nerves come from the vestibule and semicircular canal they join to form the vestibular nerve because it is attached this part is the vestibule okay and now we can tell that vestibular nerve is not for sound but for the signal of body position that signal your brain, uh, brain receives from this uh, this vestibular nerve okay so cochlear is for hearing and vestibular nerve is for body or head position and both joined together or bundled together that is the auditory nerve auditory nerve cranial nerve number eight cranial nerve number eight so auditory nerve has vestibular nerve as well as cochlear nerve and they have totally different functions right uh, that's why auditory nerve is also called vestibulo cochlear nerve together vestibulo cochlear vestibulo cochlear nerve same thing okay it has vestibular and cochlear nerves both <clears throat> now uh, you see from the middle ear a tube goes to the nasopharynx naso pharynx the uppermost part of the pharynx so from the middle ear a tube goes to the nasopharynx and this tube actually maintains helps to maintain the pressure inside the ear if the air pressure inside the ear increases then some air will go to the pharynx to reduce the pressure makes sense so this is a like passes that will let some air get out so this is very important uh, if inside the ear the pressure air pressure increases that will reduce the pressure now having this is very helpful now you understand but uh, could be problematic too in infants young uh, kids the head is small right and this is the middle ear and this is the nasopharynx so the head is small in you know a small child so the length of the tube is short makes sense the distance between ear and pharynx is short and also uh, vertically they are close to each other so it's like you know uh, like more horizontally placed now when you get you know your body grows what happens the distance increases as well as the ear goes more away 
vertically from the uh, uh, nose. So this is the middle ear up, ear is above, and this is the nasopharynx, okay, in adult. And this is child, small child. So now you see, uh, in a small child, from the nose, the fluid can easily get into the middle ear because the tube is short and horizontal. So the fluid from the nose or nasopharynx can easily go to the ear and can cause ear infection, infection in the ear. That's why, you know, some small kids suffer from ear infection a lot and very frequently. Now, when uh, your head grows, then the tube gets longer as well as the vertical distance uh, increases, right? So, the tube gets more like, you know, oblique. So, the fluid from the nose or nasopharynx cannot easily go to the ear. So that's why you, uh, the adults get uh, less ear infection or don't get ear infection like the kids or small children. Okay. So I said that uh, inside the middle ear cavity, you have three ossicles, malleus, incus, steps. And I also mentioned at the very beginning in first slide that there are two tiny muscles too. These are two tiny muscles. Tensor tympani is the larger one and stepadius the smaller one, but both are tiny. And you see, they are attached to the ossicles and they hold the ossicles in right location inside the middle ear because it is a cavity. And also, uh, you know, when the ossicles shake, or vibrate in very high frequency, uh, uh, they uh, control the movement. So they will let the ossicles move, which is very important because ossicles must move to amplify the sound, but they won't let the ossicles move too much. If too much sudden movement occur, then the ossicles may get, you know, detached from each other because these joints are not very strong joints, right? So like very loud sound, it's so like, you know, if something explodes next to you, it's that, that very strong sound will uh, try to move the ossicles a lot, sudden, sudden movement of the ossicles, but because of these tiny muscles, the ossicles will not be able to, you know, displace a lot. And that is very important. If they get displaced and detached from each other, then you will lose the ability to hear. Hearing loss will occur, right? So that is a protection. So uh, now, if you see inside the cochlea, so this is the cochlea. You know, it is a coiled structure. And here you have the oval window and this is the steps then malleus and incus and this is the tympanic membrane okay so tympanic membrane three ossicles are here and this is the cochlea now if i just take the cochlea out and put in a petri dish and you know in the fluid keep it alive and uh, since it is coiled like you know a coiled uh, uh, tongue I can make it straight just pull, hold here and pull it to make it straight so let's make it straight so it looks like a tongue like this and if I see inside the cochlea i'll see two membranes inside so upper membrane is called the vestibular membrane and lower membrane is called the basilar 
membrane okay so now if i ask you like you know uh, inside the cochlea you have two membranes so how many chambers three right one two three upper one middle one and lower one so two membranes separate the cochlea into three chambers or cavities okay now if i just a cross section like chop it and just take this slice out so it will be like this it makes sense right so this is the cochlea and this is the upper membrane vestibular this is the basilar lower membrane and three cavities those three cavities are scala vestibule scala media scala tympani here All these are filled with what? Fluid. Okay. <clears throat> the scala media, the fluid is called endolymph. This one. And in other two cavities, the fluid is called perilymph. Anyway, so those three are filled with fluid. Now, basilar membrane is here. And this is very important. Why? Because on the basilar membrane, you have a structure that is called spiral organ. Spiral organ, also called organ of corti. Same thing. Some places you will see organ of corti, some places spiral organ. Why this organ of corti is very important because the hair cells, you remember I said inside the cochlea you have the hair cells. Where in the cochlea? In the organ of corti. So these are the hair cells. And you have the hair on the hair cells. That's why they are hair cells and they are sound receptor cells. So very important, right? Okay. So uh, I can say that organ of corti rests on the basilar me uh, uh, membrane and inside the organ of corti you have the hair cells or sound receptor cells okay now on the top of the organ of corti you have another membrane like this this membrane is like a jelly like soft soft jelly like membrane this is called tectorial membrane okay so just know that that is the structure inside the cochlea two membranes three cavities on the basilar membrane you have the organ of corti or spiral organ and inside that you have the hair cells and on the top of that organ of corti another membrane soft jelly like that is the tectorial membrane okay now let's see this is the picture that i just did draw three cavities this is the middle scala media middle one and this is the organ of corti or spiral organ and these are the hair cells okay and this is the tectorial soft membrane okay now what happens uh, this is the basilar membrane and this is the organ of corti hair cells here attached to the apical end upper end of the hair cells right so these are here nucleus so these are hair cells and hair and you know that soft jelly like membrane tectorial membrane is just resting on that so what happens these hair are inserted into the tectorial membrane soft tectorial membrane they are inserted into it okay now uh, when the fluid moves waves are created in the fluid you remember i said so that waves 
in the fluid will do what will push the basilar membrane up and down make sense so the waves that will be created in the fluid under the basilar membrane will move the basilar membrane and every time the basilar membrane will move up what will happen that will press the hair against the tectorial membrane and will bend the hair let me draw just one hair cell okay so this is the hair cell nucleus here okay tectorial membrane so when you push up the hair will bend when you will the membrane will move down the hair will get straight make sense so hair is bending and getting straight again and again like you know very high frequency so when the hair bent the ion channels will get opened here and sodium and you know uh, potassium uh, those positive ions will get in and will produce action potential depolarization that is the activation of the hair cell okay so every time the hair bend the cell produce cells produce action potential so the signal electrical signal will travel through the nerve the cochlear nerve okay so this is the cochlear nerve will take the signal at a very high frequency depending on the frequency of the sound sound frequencies are very high so that is the mechanism it is a mechanical you know pressure that activate the hair cells so in case of olfaction and gustation uh, smell and taste you know that uh, the receptor cells are activated by the food molecules or smell molecules that chemical activation but in this case pressure up down and that is the mechanical activation of the hair cells okay so that is uh, how the hair cells these cells are activated and signal gets out through the cochlear nerve to the brain okay now just think that if these hair cells are destroyed the cochlea or cochlear hair cells are destroyed then the person will have hearing loss hearing loss because the hair cells are very important and no stem cell or basal cell is present here in case of olfactory and gustatory you had basal cells remember the stem cells but in cochlea you don't have so once the hair cells are destroyed or die no new hair cells are produced that's a problem right so the you need the implantation uh, otherwise the person will not be able to uh, um, hear so that is uh, the hearing loss called sensory neural hearing loss and this type of loss is like permanent loss because no stem cell is here in the organ of cortin no new hair cells will be produced okay uh, so that is uh, called sensory neural hearing loss another type of hearing loss that is you know uh, very easy to fix like you know that is called conductive hearing loss this is your ear so like if uh, i put a piece of cotton here and block the sound waves from entering into the inner part of the ear that is also will cause hearing loss if you put ear plug or you know put finger in the ear uh, then the sound wave will not get in that is also hearing loss uh, but uh, you know that's not that serious if infection occurs that will block the sound waves uh, if a tumor is formed okay or you know the wax that sometimes uh, may block the ear passes so all those can be fixed easily right so those are called conductive hearing loss so that is not that serious and you can easily fix it so conductive loss so those are two types of hearing loss and 
sensory neural hearing loss what can cause the death of the hair cells in the cochlea uh, commonly occurs due to uh, anti cancer drugs you know uh, chemotherapy or uh, uh, strong antibiotic if it is given in uh, children uh, like very strong uh, uh, penicillin that can also uh, cause the loss of hair so anti cancer drug and strong antibiotics are the main you know uh, reason another is prolonged exposure long exposure to very high frequency noise high frequency noise so if someone works in a factory uh, for a long time many hours every day uh, he must put the you know um, mask yeah, ear mask otherwise that may lead to hair loss that uh, can cause the loss of the function of the hair cells okay uh, strong antibiotic in childhood penicillin or antibiotic okay and I said anti cancer drug you know anti cancer drugs are used to kill the cancer cells but that can also can uh, kill the hair cells so uh, i think uh, uh, that's all you need to know and then uh, the last thing you see the hair cells hair of the hair cells you can see under the microscope uh, so this is the spiral organ organ of corti cochlear nerve uh, first the signal is taken to the medulla oblongata uh, where you have the cochlear nuclei okay so the cochlear nerve takes the signal to the cochlear nuclei of the medulla oblongata okay from there uh, goes to superior olivary nucleus in the medulla then goes to inferior colliculus then to the thalamus and then primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe you already know this location uh, so that is the pathway again cochlear nerve cochlear nucleus in the medulla then superior olivary nucleus in the medulla then you know inferior colliculus in the midbrain then thalamus which is the major sensory relay station and auditory cortex okay so that is the pathway how the signal arrives into the brain okay so uh, those are the things uh, you need to know from uh, the olfactory gustatory and auditory systems uh, another interesting uh, you know uh, condition that is called uh, i don't know if you have any of you have heard about it uh, that is also commonly heard uh, clinical condition uh, that is actually very bothersome to the patients uh, that is called tinnitus in common uh, uh, commonly known uh, ringing in the ear ringing in the ear tinnitus and uh, we don't know the exact reason for that but uh, you know the patient uh, often uh, hears sound although there is no source of sound uh, so intrinsically the hair cells get activated these cells get activated without any sound waves and that will send signal to the brain brain has no way to know uh, from where the sound is coming because brain is sitting in a dark cavity it cannot see outside right so uh, brain only uh, uh, receives the signal how many times the signal is arriving here that's all brain counts okay digital counting processing so uh, whatever uh, activate the hair cells the brain receives the signal and will give you the perception of sound so if uh, you can put an electrode here and 
activate these receptors without any sound uh, that will also be perceived as sound so uh, we know that somehow these cells are getting activated so brain is getting the signal but what is causing that the exact mechanism is not known some people uh, some patients very often like you know every night or very frequently uh, get you know that sound some people the frequency in some people is uh, less like once in a month or a you know year that can also happen so uh, that is another interesting thing uh, about the sound perception Okay.